we have some time now to open the floor for Q&A. Then we're going to have a short presentation to inform you about the workshops this afternoon, and then we're going to have lunch. So let me open the floor right now for Q&A, and hopefully all our presenters are ready to answer questions or comments. Yes. I mean, as, as a clinician, automatically I'm thinking of the ethical implications behind this module. And I, I guess the question would be, what are the security measures put in place to prevent <coughs> hacking, viruses, or anything else that can possibly um, interfere with or destroy the, the, the world? Okay, so in general, uh, uh, to repeat your question for everybody, we're concerned about what are the security measures that are in place to make sure that the uh, online counseling experience using a virtual world is safe and protected for the, the users, for the clients. Um, first of all, we uh, host these virtual worlds on secure servers that are firewalled, or you can actually host them on your own servers in your organization if you want to. Once we build the space, it's not uh, that uh, uh, impossible to port it over to you. Uh, what usually comes into question is, whether you're ready and willing and able to take on the technical uh, pieces of maintaining it over a period of time or whether you want to keep letting somebody else do that for you. <clears throat> so you've got that level of protection. The second thing that happens is that you, you cannot get into the virtual world without a username and a password. It's not like a, a, some online games where anybody who wants to sign up can just show up and be in there. So you're not sharing space with anybody your organization hasn't already provided access to. The third thing that's occurred is that, and, and uh, every, every project we've done has adopted this practice and we strongly recommend it, is that uh, the sign-up accounts for clients are made using aliases. So there's no identifying information about the client on that server. Uh, there's no name, there's no, uh, no real name, no address, no social security number, no email address. Uh, you give them a pseudonym. So if I decide I want to be Harry Truman because I'm from Missouri and Dave decides he wants to be Jesse James and some, somebody else decides you know, they want to be Doris Day, you know, the clients all have pseudonyms. The staff keeps a roster of who the real clients are compared with their pseudonyms. So you, you know, and quite frankly, what we found in practice is that over a sh relatively short period of time of interacting with Dave as Jesse James, I don't have to even look at my list anymore. I know, <coughs> excuse me, I know that the avatar named Jesse James is Dave Ennis. I've got all of his real information in my office. I've got it locked up in my files. I've got it on my electronic health record system or whatever inside my agency. The only thing that the computer that uh, is providing the virtual world platform for us has is Jesse James. That's all they know. There's somebody named Jesse James who logs in. And as long as Dave doesn't give his name and his password out to anybody else, that stays secure the entire time you use it. Who or what are the entities that are responsible for the getting this funded or paid for by payers. You know, like one, as you say, and, and then that's across the board for all of the technologies here. That's true for here. all of our technologies. And you yeah, said uh, always, tele psychiatry, but what about getting paid for tele substance abuse treatment, mm -hmm. as an example? Or Where is it? cell phones for your Absolutely, clients. and all of the above. Right now, the participants who are using it right now are all using grant-funded slots. However, it is our mission to take the research from this and go to payers and say, you got to pay for this. Um, we're in talks with medical assistants. They're not thrilled, but we're talking with them. <laughs> um, we have, their, their, the directorate group um, can do a little more advocacy than we can because we're a state organization and they are actively doing that sort of thing. That's why I like the fact that there are parallel um, projects in place because they can do some things um, in that area that we can't do. Um, they have some, some MCOs who have expressed a willingness to pay for it. But what we've got to do is we've got to get medical assistance to say that there's no um, prohibition. <coughs> 
from them being able to use Medicaid money to pay for it. Not that Medicaid is endorsing it, that Medicaid will pay for it because you know the MCOs are at risk. It's basically their money. Um, but we can't. We haven't gotten that answer back from MA yet. But yeah. they, it is our mission to get this paid for by third-party payers, including commercial insurance companies. And when you say this, how broadly are you presenting it in terms of uh, something yeah. like the TES or the Chess HS? Well, we didn't even know about those until today. Uh, <laughs> good thing to have this conference. No, ours is. We're talking about virtual counseling, primarily. So, but hopefully that discussion will broaden in the future to include some of these other technologies. Who else has um, a comment or a question? What do you guys think about these things? Are these pretty exciting? I have one other question. Because all these technologies are quite exciting. And there's so much that's happening in our industry in terms of integration, so on and so forth with, I guess, you, Lisa, in particular, any thoughts about how these technologies interact or interface with the electronic health records? Because that is right around the corner for so many of us. Oh, boy. Let's have all the answers. You can do anything with money. <laughs> well, I know that. I mean, yeah. there. You, the technology can be developed that these sessions can just poof, just show up in the medical records. Right. But it takes money, more than we have actually. Well, not um, money, yes, but it takes development. Well, the develop people are willing and able, and to, the development's not that big an issue if you have the money to pay the people to do the development. Okay. It's entirely doable. And that was one of the things in the grand scheme that went to the project that originally came to us was that there would be um, some automatic uploading to SMART for okay. the, well, for the group that. participation. Right. Okay. Get her I think as far as with the medical records, he, he is correct in that anything is doable. The biggest issue, at least that we found when we we're trying to work with Epic, um, which is in just outside of Madison, so we know them quite well, and it's um, really the healthcare provider's priorities. And so, for instance, on one study that we wanted to do where you could automatically go in and if someone had a, a substance abuse issue, uh, issue, then we could say, oh, let's get them to TES, or let's get TES, excuse me, or let's get them to CHESS. Um, you know, that would be really easy to do automatically through a healthcare system where they could go on their my chart sort of thing and see there's a recommendation for this. But the priority in the healthcare system is so low to do that, where we had one project that the healthcare uh, clinicians wanted to have it done, and they said, well, that would be at least a year before our IT people would get to it. So that's really where the holdup is, on our point of view. You know, I talked about connecting dots this morning and introducing people to one another who can help solve big problems. And I just want to tell you something, last week, I met with the deputy health officer of one of the states in my region who said, Jean, we just got a CMS innovation grant. I have a million and a half dollars. How can I get the primary care providers across the state to screen for and correctly refer people for mental health and substance, substance abuse treatment? And that kind of question to me is an opportunity to bring in ideas like this and start to cross-pollinate. The other place it can happen is at the regional level. I sit with the CMS regional administrator and the regional Medicaid director who works with all the state Medicaid directors. So that's one example. You need to go big through the primary care side of the house where primary and behavioral health care integration is happening. And, um, and also, I just want to put a plug in for the ATTC that we have, that SAMHSA has, for rural telehealth. Excellent. So the first thing I want to do now is to once again thank all of our speakers for graciously taking their time to come and present this morning. I think it's been an extremely exciting uh, morning of talks, so thank you guys very, very much.